hello and good afternoon to our new economy shortcut uh, new edition uh, where we want to discuss something very fundamental very important and very important for us um, which is paradigmatic in a sense that's something we are following up uh, frequently and uh, uh, touching upon one of the main economic issues of the last couple of years which or at least two years which has been the sudden uh, spike in inflation and the uh, change that that has uh, provoked in, in some minds, which has for in the first round very much uh, brought back um, conventional, let's say conventional view of economic policies, uh, bringing about people saying that they already knew and they ever said that uh, monetary policy was too expansionist and that's why finally it had produced had to produce inflation and so we should come back to the old um, economic view that uh, in that sense in that situation uh, central banks need to step in raise interest rates and do their job and even if that produces high uh, unemployment recession or by producing our expectations or real impact uh, and then at some point in this development we saw fact in fact uh, government stepping in uh, via price breaks um, um, and and uh, price controls and sub uh, subsidies and and things like that which is not being the typical reaction to inflation according to textbooks and so now we're in a situation where inflation has come down has dropped again contrary to some um, projections uh, who told us that inflation will be, is back and for a long time it will be back so this all um, makes us think or made us think about how to how to what to make out of it and if there is a need to rethink um, classic or the conventional view of uh, inflation which is has to be uh, fought by by uh, central banks and then we asked um jerome krell who's uh, with us now uh, from and his colleagues from OFCE in in paris uh, to dig deeper into this question and uh, they have already uh, uh, presented first results at our workshop last spring and now finalized the paper um, about the question if there is a paradigm shift which has been accelerated by the inflation push uh, and Jerome uh, um, will present the results and we're happy to have uh, Peter Wolfinger who has worked on the same topic recently to discuss your results. Um, as most of you know both uh, OFC Jerome and Peter uh, we didn't invite people who will be extremely contrary in, in their views um, but think about think uh, will think about the same idea in different ways so very happy to have you Jerome Clay who's uh, head of the research department at OFSU and um, an associate professor of economic at ES USCP business school in, in uh, Paris also and Peter Bofinger who's professor of economics in Würzburg and has been for many years a uh, member of the Council for Economic Exper Experts in, in Germany. This brief introduction to you both, um, happy to have you and Jerome, please um, go ahead with your presentation of the main results of our study. Hey, ma many thanks Thomas for the, for the presentation and for uh, recalling that it was uh, a, a long-lasting effort to to write down this uh, th this paper that has now been published at the Forum for a New Economy, and my co-authors and I are very grateful to the Forum for a New Economy for the opportunity you gave us to to reflect on this paradigm shift that might be behind economic policies three years or almost after the resurgence of, of inflation. Uh, I wish just to briefly mention the name of my co-authors at OFCE, François Gérolf, Sandrine Levasseur, Xavier Rago, and Francesco Saraceno, who were with me at, at writing this, this piece. I will make just a, a brief 10-minute uh, statement on the different things that you can see in this longer document. And, and then I'd be very happy to, to discuss uh, about complementary things with uh, Professor Peter Boffinger. 
So the, despite the, the use of uh, fiscal policy in combating inflation, there's still a sharp opposition between those who continue arguing that public debt reduction and low inflation are a priority for so-called sound long-run policies. And opposition with those that argue that priorities and challenges might be elsewhere, maybe in climate mitigation. And for this second part of people, some kind of group of people, these priorities may require change in the desirable inflation rate, the relevant debt target, and maybe what should be requested is a change in the policy framework. In the paper, we think that those who argue for so-called sound policies of lower debt, lower inflation, they do stick to a policy paradigm that in our view has lost its relevance due to recent events and also due to many things that I will be uh, discussing. And so instead of this policy paradigm that we've seen for so many years, we propose a limited shift towards a paradigm that reconciles different policy horizons from the short to the long run. So in a nutshell, the new paradigm we propose would be embedding four main ideas, which are not revolutionary ideas, but ought to be put into the toolkit, according to us. First, the first idea is one should not overestimate monetary policy because it can't do everything. The second idea is one should not underestimate fiscal policy because it can matter. The third thing is one should renew the policy mix. Therefore, one should facilitate ex ante coordination between economic policies. And the fourth point is that the policy mix we think should be developed should depart from the so-called three T's approach First T for timely measures, second T for temporary measures, and third T for targeted measures. We do think and favor what we call in the paper the tilt measures. We do think that, yes, uh, policy measures, be they monetary or fiscal, must be timely. They can be implemented in due time. Okay, we do not discuss that. But they must be investment-related and also supply-driven policies, which was absent from the former uh, paradigm. We also think that sh they shouldn't be temporary, but lasting in order to match the entire horizon of the ecological transition. And finally, we also think they should be targeted, and the tilt last is for targeted. They should be targeted towards intertemporal fairness because the present generation cannot leave the full burden of climate change to the future generations. And it should be targeted towards intratemporal uh, fairness to prevent strong redistributive effects of public policies that are being implemented to uh, foster ecological transition. So over the, four, uh, the past four decades, the sound policies we heard about have inched on a widely accepted division of labor in economic policy making. Let's call it the separation paradigm. Simply stated, fiscal and monetary policies would be separated in terms of their respective objectives. Governments must focus on debt sustainability, and central banks must concentrate on the macroeconomy with their main focus on inflation control. This separation paradigm owes to a set of results, some of which are more assumptions than they are results. Fluctuations are supposedly optimal as they are determined by the reaction of households and firms to technological shocks with only limited market failures. Nominal wage rigidities may cause the economy to deviate from its natural growth rate in the short run and therefore the economy will thus experience demand-led fluctuations. Third point of the former paradigm, this separated paradigm, there is a need for structural reforms, which by removing rigidities like wage rigidities will increase the natural growth rate of the economy. Fourth point, discretionary macro policies are ineffective at stabilizing the economic activity. 
abiding by monetary and fiscal rules is preferable as both serve as anchors to agents' expectations. And the fifth point is that short-term fluctuations in production have no influence on the natural growth rate. There is a dichotomy between the short and the long run. Easy to see in the recent past that this paradigm has faced many challenges, particularly following the global financial crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, and with the resurgence of inflation. Indeed, governments have increasingly intervened with fiscal policy to stabilize economies and combat inflation, contrary to the traditional division of labor. Our paper examines recent policy responses, including the US Inflation Reduction Act, that are examples of departures from traditional policy frameworks. The paper also turns towards the academic literature and investigates the effects of monetary and fiscal policies. And it is very striking that empirical research has shown mixed results regarding the effectiveness of monetary policies at achieving its objectives. The effects of monetary policy in the literature go usually in the expected direction, but these effects are slow and their size is not always huge. In contrast, empirical research about fiscal policy has shown its effectiveness, and many researchers highlight the need to stimulate public investment for long-run growth in sharp opposition with the separation paradigm. With relatively sizable fiscal multiplier effects and hints of depth sustainability in the academic literature, the beneficial use of active fiscal policy seems underestimated by the EU, for instance. This is a pity that the consensus on the separation of fiscal and monetary policies remains an intellectual anchor for the EU governments. When we have a look at the proposal for the reform of the Stability and Growth Pact, it is a pity that this separation remains. So the necessity of a shift in paradigm also stems from some additional facts that the current separation paradigm has so far underestimated. The first fact is the high frequency of deep economic crisis. I mentioned the global financial crisis, COVID-19, a war at our border that I didn't mention yet. For all these economic crises, standard automatic stabilizers are certainly not enough. And the other fact that makes the separation paradigm underestimating the, the importance of it is the necessary relationship between the short-run economic stabilization and long-run economic objectives like energy transition and the reduction in inequality. The short-run and the long-run are well connected. So as a response to challenges like climate change mitigation, inflation resurgence, we do propose in this paper a new paradigm of joint responsibilities in monetary and fiscal policy. Over the last decade, the world has shifted from one where fiscal policy was meant to be implemented via rules, such as the full play of automatic stabilizers, to one where fiscal policy was allocated many different objectives while facing a recurrent crisis. Fighting inequality, demand and crisis management, climate change, European convergence, and price stability, fiscal policy has taken care of all these things. We do not think it is a problem in itself because fiscal policy consists of a wide set of tools, taxes, subsidies, expenditure, regulation. Nevertheless, a new paradigm is needed to coordinate expectations into a consistent set of policies that the former paradigm cannot prescribe because of its reliance on a restrictive application of the so-called Tinbergen separation principle. While there is a need for as many policy tools as there are policy objectives, separate allocation is no longer relevant in a shaky world. So simply put, monetary and fiscal policies must each target price stability, economic activity, debt sustainability, 
and climate change mitigation, not separately, but under a shared view. So the new paradigm that we advocate for gives equal consideration to fiscal and monetary policies and to their interactions. These interactions and their respective spillover effects demand policy and political coordination and a good dose of pragmatism in contrast with the binding rules embedded in the separation paradigm. In comparison with the separation paradigm that only tolerates automatic stabilizers, the new paradigm enlarges the scope for fiscal policy. Fiscal policy should be oriented towards public and private investment to foster, for instance, the ecological transition as one can learn from the US experience with the IRA. The new paradigm thus favors a supply-driven fiscal policy. So among institutions able to foster fiscal coordination, one cannot ignore the possible, res possible emergence of a central fiscal capacity. The debate about such a capacity has changed after COVID-19 crisis and after the adoption of next generation EU. The issuance of European public debt proves that the tools are available for joint investment policies. In addition, the identification of European public investment needs is now well documented. So the supply side nature of fiscal policy that the new paradigm advocates for calls for a coordination of public investment in Europe that a central fiscal capacity may help deliver. Fostering economic coordination between the ECB on the one hand and member states on the other hand is politically very sensible. In the paper, we do not challenge the central bank independence. Meanwhile, we do argue that the explicit recognition of a role for fiscal policy on price stability gives shared responsibilities in the inflation dynamics, thus alleviating the pressure on monetary policy at targeting inflation. Moreover, Recognizing the role of fiscal policy in combating inflation would remove the obligation to constantly communicate on the effectiveness of monetary policy at curbing inflation, although this is not always correct. As the paper shows, inflation has had multiple sources, not only on the supply side, that monetary policy alone cannot all fix on its own. It needs fiscal policy. I may add a, a final point. Many argue that the recent policy mix is only transitory, as it has been used to combat inflation in exceptional circumstances. Therefore, they argue, the separation paradigm doesn't need to be challenged. It has had sufficient internal flexibility to perform rather well. We claim instead that adding exceptions to the separation paradigm is not enough. The separation paradigm has not allowed a balance between objectives. The obsession with price stability that has been embedded in the European governance framework has limited the scope of fiscal policies towards public investment and economic stabilization. This is a costly outcome when large public investments are needed to accelerate the ecological transition, not even to mention the defense needs that have spiked since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We argue, therefore, that the past decade highlights the need for a new paradigm for both good and bad times with shared, not separated objectives. And I may stop there and look forward to discussing with Peter Boffinger. Thank you. Thank you, Jérôme. Um, I hand over to Peter. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I try to share my screen with you and hope it will work. So let's see. It should be. I'm sorry, no, it just. Okay, can you see it, everything? Okay, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure that I have the opportunity uh, to discuss uh, the paper by Jerome and uh, his colleagues. Um, and in fact, I share almost everything that was said. Um, and therefore, my presentation has some kind of complementary 
character. It's a paper that I've written um, uh, on, uh, supported by the IMK. Um, and uh, the paper I, uh, was finalized uh, last last autumn. I think it fits nicely to uh, with with what uh, Jerome has presented. So the uh, main message uh, of of Jerome and his colleagues is uh, there is this separation paradigm, and uh, this separation paradigm uh, can be characterized by saying, okay, the central banks have more or less. Uh, responsibility for macroeconomic stability, above all inflation, while fiscal policy is more or less uh, is, is more or less responsible for allocation, for distribution, and in this context also for taking care that public debt is is limited, that uh, that the financial sustainability is is guaranteed. So and now the new paradigm um, presented by uh, Jerome says, one must give equal consideration to fiscal and monetary policies, and especially in terms of uh, macroeconomic stabilization, and also above all in terms of uh, fighting uh, inflation, stabilizing uh, the price level. Assuming this uh, new paradigm, um, what emerges immediately, we have an assignment problem. There's no more the clear division that characterizes the separation paradigm, because now Fiscal policy and monetary policy have a responsibility for macroeconomic stabilization. And the question is, how can one now define this assignment pro uh, problem? How can one assign the responsibilities to fiscal policy and to, to monetary policy? And I think here, this assignment problem depends on different uh, elements. First, it depends on the type of shock. Is it a demand shock or a supply shock? Shock, it depends on the size of the shock, especially uh, if you have a very large negative demand shock, uh, monetary policy comes close to the effective lower bound. It depends on the institutional framework. Do you have a national currency area or do you have a, a currency area like a monetary union, like the euro area? It depends on the time horizon of the government. There are time inconsistency problems. And as a general criterion, um, we have these different T's, the targeted, timely, temporary, uh, and um, this is also something that, that has to take been taken into account. So let me go through this a little bit, and let's start with the sim most simple case. You have a demand shock, and the nice thing of demand shocks is there's no trade-off between output stabilization and price stability. And in a simple ASAD model, you can show that uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy are equally able to deal with the demand shock and negative demand shock shifts the AD curve downwards and with fiscal policy and monetary policy, you can just uh, shift the AD curve back to equilibrium. So in principle, fiscal policy and monetary policy are able to deal uh, with, with demand shocks. Then of course that raises the question, how can we then differentiate uh, between uh, fiscal policy and, and monetary policy? And um, this leads also to this to this T. So if you have monetary policy in the situation of demand shock, what is positive with monetary policy, the inside lag, so the decision lag uh, is relatively short. The central bank uh, council can decide every every six weeks or even shorter uh, whether to change interest rate. But the problem with monetary policy is that it has long and variable outside legs. I think it's still not so clear, also in the right in the dis dis discussion right now, uh, how these how long these legs are, how variable they are. But obviously, they are longer and variable. So timely is a problem. Targeted, you can say monetary policy is not a very targeted way to uh, to to control accurate demand. The effects are very indirect. Um, Above all, you can see that, that the effects today are mainly via the housing, the construction sector. And uh, if if you follow the discussions um, uh, of the ECB representatives, uh, they are now concerned about service inflation. And it's a very indirect way to get service inflation down by causing a slump in the construction sector. That's a very indirect link, uh, which is not really a very targeted form of macroeconomic policy and the main problem with monetary policy is it has side if unwarranted unwanted side effects on the exchange rate on the banking system on fiscal sustainability and wealth distribution 
of all the very low interest rates uh, in the years 2014 to 2020 uh, had a strong effect on the wealth distribution. So what is then the main case for monetary policy as a tool stabilizing uh, the macroeconomy? I would say it's mainly the case if the government itself is the source of the demand shocks, in the case of the United States, uh, when very uh, generous transfers were given to the households, or if you have a government that has a very short-term view uh, where the time inconsistency problem, problem arises and you have a central bank which is independent. I think that's the genuine case where you still would say that monetary policy is needed. Uh, with fiscal policy, you can say timely. Um, one has now learned from the crisis that in co contrary to what the textbooks say, that the inside lag is very short. So governments have been able to react very uh, uh, instantaneously uh, to the crisis and the outside lag is also very short. And of course, I think that's also something that uh, the crisis have shown. The measures can be tailored exactly to the area which is mainly affected uh, by, by a shock. So in general, one would say if fiscal policy has a longer time horizon, it's the better instrument for macroeconomic stabilization. Of course, there are special cases for fiscal policy uh, when uncertainty is very high and the interest rate channel is weak and above all, uh, when interest rates are at the effective lower bound. So this, in the case of demand shocks, it's, it's, it's not not hundred percent clear uh, which whether whether fiscal policy or monetary policy are superior. It really depends uh, on on these different uh, factors that I've enumerated here. So the more interesting case are supply shocks, and supply shocks have the negative uh, feature that they that they constitute a trade off for monetary policy uh, because the if uh, the supply shock shifts the aggregate supply curve upwards and monetary policy is not able to to shift the aggregate supply curve backwards they they, only, they can only shift the demand curve and with this demand curve shifting you have this trade off uh, for, for monetary policy if you have a restrictive policy you get inflation down but you increase the negative output get um, and uh, if you Try to stabilize output, uh, inflation increases. And I think this trade off, in my view, is the explanation why the ECB has hesitated for so long until it increased interest rates because the euro area economy was in a, was in a weak shape. And so this is something that um, that uh, characterizes supply shocks and, and creates problems for, for monetary po uh, policy. And, and you can say that, that if monetary policy deal, has to deal uh, with supply shocks, more or less, it has to create a recession or very weak growth has to create unemployment to get inflation down. And that's a very unpleasant feature of, of uh, monetary policy in the situation of, of supply shocks. And here we have the nice thing uh, of what is called unconventional fiscal policy uh, and the insight that fiscal policy can shift the aggregate supply curve back to equilibrium. I think that's the, the interesting and attractive feature of a fiscal policy. So it can help with its, in, with its instruments to, 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 to get to the root of, of the shock and can shift the supply, the supply curve and can therefore avoid that uh, you need unemployment or recession to deal uh, with the inflationary shock. And I think that's something we have seen now uh, in, the, in the energy crisis. Uh, so fiscal policy has instruments uh, which which can shift to the AX curve directly. They can change, they can, can uh, reduce indirect taxes. Uh, there are uh, price breaks that can be applied and they can also use some kind of income policy or incomes policy um, to avoid that a supply shock is now uh, magnified by wage policies, by wage price shocks. So I think there has a lot, there are many examples for that. And um, I think that's, that's something that is really now a new insight from, from this crisis, that the fiscal policy is a powerful player in the case of supply shocks. One has to, of course, to mention that uh, this role of fiscal policy is only advisable if the shock is really a transitory shock and you have not permanently higher uh, prices. But what we have seen 
uh, in 2022 is that the larger part of these price increases of energy was it was a shock and not a permanently higher uh, price price for for energy. And the interesting thing is now that this is exactly what many many countries have done. So this is a uh, this is uh, the table comes from Bruegel. And you can see that almost all countries have, have used these instrument, instruments. They've reduced energy taxes. They had some kind of price regulation. Um, so they really tried to, to, to affect uh, prices directly. And there's an interesting study by the IMF. Uh, and they say, overall, we find that these unconventional measures reduced euro area inflation by one or two, two percentage points uh, in 2022. Uh, similar results can be obtained from ECB studies. So I think also the empirics show that it's a good thing to use fiscal policy in, in this way. Okay, so we have now the difference, um, demand shocks, supply shocks, and there's a third case where I think it's important uh, for fiscal policy to play a role where we need a much stronger role for fiscal policy. And that's in the special case uh, of a monetary union like, um, the European Monetary Union, uh, where uh, this uh, uh, the classical uh, 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 the separation uh, uh, paradigm has led to the to the view that it's only the ECB that has a responsibility for price stability, and that the national governments don't have any responsibility as far as price stability is concerned. And um, I think uh, this here the separation problem has really led to, to huge to huge problems um, because uh, due to the nature of a monetary union, if you have shocks at the national level, uh, the ECB can only react to these national shocks to an ins in an insufficient way according to the economic uh, size or weight of a country. So for the country where the shock uh, where, where the shock has happened, the response is too weak, but by reacting to a national shock in an insufficient way, it creates to a negative transmission of the ECB's monetary policy to those countries who are not suffering a shock. So uh, if national governments are not reacting to national shocks, uh, it leads to, to, to a uh, yeah, in, insufficient, uh, insufficient re response of the ECB and a negative transmission to the other uh, countries. And um, what, what is important, uh, if, we, if we had a, a responsibility of national uh, governments for price stability, you can see uh, in, my, in my chart, 2015, 2016, uh, in, in Germany, the inflation rate was much too low. At the same time, the German uh, government had a surplus um, in its, in its uh, fiscal balance, and that would have been an obvious case uh, for for the German government to boost its economy to get uh, German inflation back to two percent by means of of fiscal policy, and I think that really shows if you have a monetary union, it's really important not to have the full responsibility for price stability with the ECB because it's difficult for the ECB to achieve it, uh, but instead uh, also to 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 have to have this this. Uh, this obligation for national governments also to try to keep their national inflation rate close to the ECB target, and that would have been would have avoided lots of lots of problems. The whole zero interest rate or negative interest rate phase could have been avoided had the German government been willing to get the German inflation rate back to two percent by means of, of fiscal policy. Okay, so far so good. If you want if you want to read more about it, I can recommend you my study. That I've written for IMK. Okay, and now I look forward to your comments and to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> yes, men as mentioned at the beginning, uh, we didn't expect a very controversial uh, reaction, but um, this wasn't the purpose. Uh, we are in a very new field of rethinking and developing a new paradigm, and at some point, uh, it's interesting to discuss. But maybe we can anticipate some of the arguments and perhaps bring in the ECB, um, who's argu arguing um, that, I mean, at first glance, there was inflation. They raised interest rates, maybe late uh, to some. 
and then inflation came down. So principally, uh, one could argue, and that's what the ECB is doing. I mean, in, in regularly to to argue that in the end, to 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 tell people that in the end it's like the usual. It has been all like usual. So what would you say, Jerome and Peter, to this uh, point? And maybe then you can also come back to the different points that you made in, in your uh, respective papers. So I'm starting, maybe? Yes? Yes. Uh, so th thank you, uh, Thomas, uh, for, for, for the question. And thank you, Peter, for the complimentary view, uh, which is very nice and, and very helpful. Uh, re regarding the the question on monetary policy, I, I think it was impossible for the ECB not to raise rates, uh, although it did so quite late, according to some, it started raising the interest rates in, say, it was July 2022, if I'm correct, and uh, they, they did so because of the European governing framework that gave them the ECB as the main uh, objective, price stability. And of course, price stability was not achieved at that time. So they needed to do something and they, did, they needed to go back to the conventional toolkit to try to uh, limit inflation. So they couldn't do otherwise. And they couldn't do otherwise also at the time uh, before, because the, the Fed the Federal Reserve in the U.S. had started before. And since rates were rising in the U.S., not in Europe before July 2022, uh, that meant that the euro tended to depreciate, which increased uh, inflationary pressures in Europe at that time. And, and we, we were caught, us Europeans, in, in a game where we needed to raise rates to at least stop the euro's depreciation that was feeding uh, the inflation episode because the price of oil for us is being denominated in US dollars. So if the, the euro is depreciating, the bill of the oil shock was rising quite automatically. So we had to do so. Does it mean that, uh, that, that it was successful as the ECB is saying? One argument, an easy one is the following. As we are being reporting in the paper, it takes almost 18 months for a rise in interest rates to start producing the expected effects. What are the expected effects of rising interest rates? A decline in inflation. Okay, so meaning that if we start, we saw interest rates increase in July 2022, we would have been expecting that early in, or late in 2023, inflation would have started decreasing. But it picked, inflation picked in October 2022. After October 2022, it started decreasing. Why? Because of monetary policy? No, impossible. Because of the channels of transmission, the time lags, it couldn't work easily. So we needed more time to see monetary policy be effective. So what did happen? After October 2022, the price shock, the energy price shock, started uh, reducing. So, so it it's, was a supply shock that finally was temporary. That's good news for the Europeans that saw inflation decline. So there is a narrative by the ECB at saying they've made things correctly and it was, uh, it was effective. They certainly did things correctly regarding their mandate, but in the end, they, it was not possible, it was immediately effective. Okay, so we can't believe that story. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe just to add, because I have in mind some people then argue that maybe usually it's the, the case or maybe the, the legs are like this, but there's an expectations channel. That's what, uh, which also needs to be uh, brought in uh, to explain why, for example, in the US and in the end in the EU, EU uh, Eurozone, there's not been any real impact, negative, very big real impact. Uh, so what, 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 you, what we usually also see uh, as a, a driver of inflation expectations 
is the price of energy. See the price of energy increase and inflation expectations increase. The price of energy plummets, inflation expectations plummet. And the, the price of energy is not being managed by any central bankers. So there's a disconnection to some extent between monetary policy as it has been implemented and its so-called immediate impact in inflation expectations. Peter. Yeah, I, I widely share what Jerome said. And I think if you discuss the effects of monetary policy, I think it's also important to have this kind of Vixel idea, idea in your mind. So not every increase in interest rates means that monetary policy is restrictive. So what was happening is that we had extremely low interest rates. And what, what happened, at least from July to, I would say, uh, yeah, winter uh, 22, is that, that interest rates return from very expansionary to a kind of normal. I think that's important to have in mind that there is a normalization, which then is not yet restrictive. So in order to be restrictive, it means that we must cross a threshold, which really then has, has a restrictive effect on, on, on the economy. And so I would say a major part of the increase interest rate increased by the ECB was just a return to normal, which did not have restrictive effects. And that's maybe also an explanation why you don't have a, a recession in the United States, because we, we, we came from extremely low interest rates and, and the major part is just normalization. Uh, which does not have a negative effect on output. And of course, now I would say the ECB, after having crossed the threshold to the restrictive terrain, uh, the risk is that they will stay restrictive for too long because they have the feeling once they reduce interest rates, even maybe by a quarter of a percentage point, it's already expansionary, which is nonsense because if, if you are above the neutral or normal threshold, even if you reduce interest rates, you're still restrictive. Now, I think it's very important to have in mind that for an assessment of monetary policy, you need this kind of benchmark of a neutral rate. And if you don't have it, um, it's, it, you cannot make uh, uh, cannot make statements about restriction or expansion or no moment. Um, if I may, and uh, I, uh, I agree with, with Peter about being clear about the real interest rate, but there are also immediate, not immediate, but they are cost with rising nominal interest rates for those willing to own their houses because they will go to the bank and they may face some limitations on being supplied some credit because nominal interest rates are rising despite the real rate being still negative because they will face a limitation in the ability uh, to, to, to get a loan based on their income, uh, which will be made proportional to their nominal rate. And higher nominal rates are also being uh, uh, creating larger costs for fiscal policy that makes uh, these deficits rise and get closer and closer to the 3%, or if they are above 3%, get even further, that may restrict fiscal margins for maneuver for, 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 for governments, which will therefore be uh, some cost like they, they're on the demand side. And we, we turn back to, to what you did uh, present uh, regarding different types of shocks. I think nominal rates, they also do matter. Well, but uh, if you take mortgages, they were, they are, they were so, so low that even increased by one percentage points or two percentage points can be regarded as normalization. Yes, so yes, we had, we had one percent mortgage rates in the beginning of at the end of two thousand twenty one, and inflation was expectations were much higher. So this was really extremely low, and so a certain normalization is not something that immediately has a restrictive effect. I would say, but reducing the expansionist effect. Yes. Yeah, well, but look, if you're driving on the autobahn with one hundred ninety kilometers. Uh, and you reduce your speed from 190 to 160, and uh, you can say I've reduced my speed, but it can still be uh, the the speed can be still much too high. So I think you need this reference point when you talk about monetary policy, and not immediately say any increase in interest rates means restriction. 
that's at least the insight by Vixel. Okay, I would, I would, on the, I mean, we're still on the diagnosis. What, what is, you know, maybe uh, the, what can we learn from the inflation? That's about the effectiveness of of monetary policy. Uh, there's one question that I would like to bring in by Ronald Janssen, uh, quite interestingly, who says that the IMF, I can't, uh, I'm just he's stating this, um, by, by its chief economist questioned its study on non-conventional fiscal policy succeeding to fight supply shock inflation by claiming EU countries had simply been very lucky with the timing when supply bottlenecks, why, because uh, supply bottlenecks were easing at, on time, which seems to have been the case indeed. And in energy prices came down and uh, uh, bottlenecks uh, faded away. So um, what's your response? Is there really a serious way to say, or have all been just lucky? I mean, the uh, central banks as well as governments, and in the end, it's still to prove that this these measures were effective. Well, I can only refer to the studies that were made by the ECB and by the MF, and they say it was effective. There was also an element of luck, of course, but um, so far these studies have shown that it has been successful. You can see it the other way around now. So in Germany, we have now an increase on the value added tax on, on the food in restaurants, which is quite considerable, and now service inflation goes up. And now the ECB is concerned about service inflation. Yeah? And, and, and I was writing a column uh, last autumn, don't do that because now we're in a period where slowly inflation gets down and don't do these measures. We also raised the, the, the price for carbon uh, emissions in Germany. There was no need for it in terms of, of uh, incentives uh, to save uh, energy because prices are high enough. So the several measures which increased inflation because we needed the money, it, it, the German government was just need, in need of money, but it has a negative impact on, on inflation and now makes it more difficult for the ECB to, to, to reduce its rates. And related to, to luck or, or not luck, we certainly have had some luck, but bad luck when it did start, first and foremost. And after maybe we were lucky enough that the shock was was temporary. But when we look at the EU experiences, the countries that have seen inflation grow uh, the less are also the countries that have been using fiscal instruments the most. Okay, yeah. Look at uh, what happened in Spain, in Portugal, in yeah. France and in Italy. Maybe in contrast with with Germany, they started very early with the price caps, the tax, the, the gas shields, and the likes. It was certainly very costly for the public finances, but finally, uh, inflation was more limited, and the, the the decline in purchasing power was was slower. So, so they they were implementing policies that to some point, were effective. I, I agree with uh, with Peter and arguing that this is what the, the literature is also saying. It's not only good luck. Looking forward and talking about lessons from the from this crisis, you're mentioning in the paper, and you already mentioned it a, a minute ago, um, the, the example of Spain. Because one of the question then would be, what is the kind of real intervention that you would um, advise, given that there has not been, let's say the situation has been strange because the mainstream economists all said, well, it's about central banks and central banks should do it. And then nobody else was there. And then the governments under the pressure of real people pressure and, and the real situation started to do some price breaks and some other uh, subsidies and, and so on. So um, is there something to learn from this episode on how to best do it if there is a supply side inflation? Well, I, I wouldn't like to be to be final in the, in the argument because uh, I do not have myself a clear idea of what ought to be done uh, next time it happens. The reason is, uh, and this is something that has happened in France, for instance, not only in Spain, I was just saying that, uh, we've been limiting the, the the surge in the price of gas, the price of oil, we've been giving people some checks, 
which was good for the purchasing power at fighting the increase of inflation uh, and the, its impact on the, the real income. But meanwhile, it was not a very good signal in favor of the ecological transition and, and sobriety. So, so I, I do not mean that everything that was done was perfect. It was much targeted towards the inflation episode creating some trade-off at the expense of longer run uh, objectives. And this is where we should be heading the, the group of authors of this paper today, discuss today, because we are arguing that it's not only the short term that is important, it's also the longer run. And we do think and feel that the current paradigm, the current uh, governance in Europe, is creating bad trade-offs uh, unfavorable to the longer run. And I th we do think we should go into this direction. So uh, we will be uh, in favor of certainly a fiscal policy for the long run. What is it for real concretely? I'm not clear on that. Uh, I just would like at least to see Europeans change their minds as to the separation of, uh, uh, of objectives. Governments are not only there to stabilize debt, there are good reasons to reduce debt, there are good reasons sometimes to increase debt. So, and if we increase debts in order to foster uh, the greening of the economy, certainly it will be better for this generation and the new generation. But as to what are the the good recipes, uh, if I had it, uh, I'd be very happy to tell. Okay. But, but what we did learn from this episode, the different crises and the involvement of governments, is that governments, by their policies, they do matter. They improve the situations. Okay. We, if we turn back to how we thought about fiscal policies 10 to 15 years ago, it was entirely the opposite. And for decades, fiscal policy had to stick to rules. Why? Because fiscal policy was not timely. It took so much time to go to the parliament and decide on the law of finance. Then, after taking the decision, implement the fiscal policy that if it was in favor of stabilizing the economy, it would happen after the economy had already stabilized. So you created a negative shot out of your fiscal policy. We are now discussing, and Peter made it very clear, that fiscal policy can prove useful because it's very timely. There's just one issue uh, in, my, in my view, which is that sometimes fiscal policy have been implemented so rapidly that there were no consensus, say, at the parliament to take these decisions. So maybe there's a democratic deficit in some of the fiscal impetus that has been put in the economy after this shock. So we need a shift response, a, a swift response, but maybe we shouldn't be doing the same after all shocks. We need to discuss, and maybe we need to discuss at the level at least of the EU, because there are some challenges that are shared with the EU, like, uh, like the greening of the economy. Yeah. And it may, but, but for so maybe if I just can can uh, say something about what can we learn. And for me, one uh, implication is that we have to do something to limit the supply side shocks, these energy price shocks. And one answer would be a strategic oil reserve, like they have it in the United States, so that the EU is then a kind of, of a profitable speculator purchasing. Uh, oil when uh, oil prices are low and selling them when they are higher because you can see these huge waves in, in, in oil prices. And the other thing is to consider the way how we implement these carbon taxes. Uh, so in our textbooks, we are fixed amounts. Um, but the problem is if the underlying prices have a strong variation, uh, the incentives to the consumers are not very clear because even if you have a constant uh, carbon tax, if the, if the basis, base price goes down, it, it's, not a, it's not a price pass uh, that is foreseeable for the consumers. And so my approach would be to have adjustable carbon taxes. So for instance, if now uh, the prices for gas and, and, and oil go down, then to increase 
the carbon tax in order to keep the consumer price stable. And if if the if the global market prices go up, then you can reduce uh, the tax so that you can create a price path. Government revenues out. So, for instance, if now prices go down, global prices go down, the tax goes up. Then you can transfer it uh, to the to the households. Yeah? I think the idea that you have a, a price fixed price pass for carbon taxes, irrespective of what the market price is doing, is is flawed. And I think that's that's what we have, what we've seen in Germany. And so, an adjustable carbon uh, tax could could provide this stability. Uh, for 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 consumers, and it could also then prevent these shocks uh, for for the inflation rate coming from global energy prices. Um, so, otherwise, I, I we yes, I I just want, would uh, wanted to add that we have another study that has been prepared, maybe contradicting a little bit uh, this point uh, prepared by Tom Krebs and Isabella Weber, which came out last week on. Uh, the lessons from price breaks and um, and these um, things, which is complementary and touches a little bit about, about this question. Because I, anyway, regarding the the answer, I think there's a lot of space to better understand and to better work to work on this to understand what are the best instruments. Because what has happened, in fact, was that governments did it on their own. Oh, there was a very long debate in Germany on the price gas price break, uh, which came very lately in the end, which came, but it came very lately. So for a next case, which may come or not come in, in the exact same way, um, it would be helpful to, to have a more knowledge and more advice about what could be the best instruments. And that's Maybe open, uh, Peter, or to, to discuss on, on the efficiency. And maybe it will take some time to really learn the lessons from what has happened in, in the last uh, two or three years to do it properly in empirical terms. Um, Jerome, you wanted to? No, maybe, maybe say that it, it, if something has been good with this inflation episode, it, it was not good, but one thing that was good that we are now discussing about public policies. There are different arrays of public policies. You were mentioning uh, the paper by Tom Krebs and Isabella Weber. We were having the, the presentation by Peter. Peter was arguing in favor of very important point about the inability, whatever happens for the ECB to target something else than the average inflation rate between the member states, which gives also uh, some uh, some arguments in favor of different fiscal stances by the member states so that they could improve their price convergence. Because the more price convergence we may be having, the more optimal monetary policy will be average for everyone. So far, it has been average for nobody. Everybody was either, either above or below the target for years. With the inflation episode, everybody was way above. But if we go back to the former uh, situation, there will be some with too low inflation, some with too high inflation, and monetary policy in the middle with everybody being dissatisfied. So let's talk about public policies and let's make some pedagogy about this because we must make sure that these policy reforms we're discussing are feasible and that the public will understand about it. It's what Peter was arguing about the the price of carbon, it's something that many economists do argue upon. We should raise the price of carbon. But if we do so, we create redistributive effects. We know that so that we need to use tax revenues to alleviate these redistributive effects. But we need to know the information. Is it uh, against the poor, these redistributive effects. It's is it against the old or young people? Is it against those that live in rural area and are in cities? There are so many inequalities, inequalities between the people in different terms that it's 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 challenging. But thanks to inflation, we discuss public policies mm -hmm. and not only monetary policy. Now, so one example of this kind of approach. Uh, which looks more at the national level is now the ECB says, okay, we have an inflation problem, but it would be interesting 
where from which countries does inflation come from? I think it would be interesting to, just to have this kind of aggregate view looking where where is comes where do the inflation pressures come? Which countries are the countries with high inflation? What are the problems in these countries and how what we can what can we do about this? Uh, and but that's not discussed at all. Uh, it's just this kind of accurate view. Uh, and of course, then also the, the policy is not, not targeted at all. Um, we are slowly coming to an end, but there's one question uh, directly from Markus Schreier or from the audience. Uh, I think you can, yeah, get in and speak. You need to unmute and then okay, maybe <laughs> okay. Um, if not, give us a sign if you still want to speak. Otherwise, um, I'm I, I would have one question, which is a maybe technical question, but would be in the step before intervening. You mentioned, and we were agreeing, and you were agreeing on the fact that there's a difference to be made between supply side and demand side and inflation. How easy is it in a in a current situation when inflation gets up to really decide for a central bank and know quickly where it comes from? Is that easy, or what, how would you say? Well, if the easy is the euro area is growing by zero point six percent. Um, and last year it was 0 0.5, and it's the currency area with the weakest growth uh, in the whole world. I would think that it must be mainly due to the supply side and not so much to the demand side. Jerome? I'd say it's not so easy to, to separate both because, of course, because of, of markets, they are both connected. So what happens on the supply side will be inch on the demand side and, and the reverse. So knowing in real time where inflation does come from is not so so easy in real time. Okay, we see energy shocks, uh, we see food prices uh, increasing, declining. But after that, there's this uh, transmission to different uh, costs that makes it either supply and final demand or immediately demand and finally supply. So. So it seems for Europe, it was mainly supply uh, driven. So it's not a surprise exposed was maybe not so easy to make this sure in real time. Okay. I mean, just to, to put it like this, uh, you're very much framing your, your analysis. And that was very somebody for us to in, in this paradigmatic setting. So um, supposing that and stating and it's and not so difficult to say that uh, there is a maybe a paradigm shift and there's a paradigm shift in policy making and the separation between the roles uh, ongoing and you very uh, well explained and described that it's already happening um, but as with all paradigm shifts uh, that's nothing that comes in one day and it's nothing that comes straight on uh, so there's a lot of um things to to understand to better understand and uh you both have contributed to this uh we're not ready pro probably but um so many thanks um peter jerome and your colleagues Xavier and the others um for having contributed to this and uh, published these studies you will find the uh, um, links um in the chat and on our website um, immediately and yeah happy to have all uh, comments on on these uh, things and we will in a sense uh, of what i said continue to work on this and uh, consult you both on these topics thank you thank you, thank you. thomas thank you Peter. Bye. happy easter you too thank you you too as well <laughs>